So imagine a land raider but much bigger with more guns and maybe you'd get something like the Mastodon. Hello and welcome back to All Specs Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. Today we're back for another incredibly enormous Forge World Space Marine unit in the Mastodon or the Relic Mastodon Super Heavy Siege Transport to give it its full name. This enormous transport will set you back £326 if you're in the UK, or a cool $505 if you live in the US. It is an absolutely enormous chunk of resin. In this video we'll take a look at the rules and data sheet for this mighty beast, any obvious synergies or combos on the tabletop, and how I would run one myself in a game of 40k. In the lore, the Mastodon is a extremely heavy space marine tank that was used in the days of the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy. A rare and precious resource, the Mastodon was only deployed for the assaults against the most heavily armoured fortifications and entrenched enemy positions. Some legions were particularly notable using the Mastodon, the Salamanders in particular could transport a large portion of their legion via the tanks, although with a capacity of 40 marines you didn't need all that many even for this mighty feat. The Mastodon's armoured bulk is protected further via void shields, and it is most commonly equipped with their forward siege melter array and turret mounted skyreaper missiles. Let's see what this thing can do on the tabletop then, when we deploy this behemoth into the heart of the battle. So here we have the Relic Mastodon's datasheet, which is one of the augmented ones from Warhopedia, which is a really good online resource for getting datasheets with the points costs built in. The Mastodon is of course a Lord of War tank for Codex Space Marines, and as it has no war gear options at all, it will always cost you a mighty 1054 points. So if you are playing in a standard 2k game of Warhammer 40k, this will be over half of your points in one model. As with most Forge World things these days, it's run more often in bigger, less competitive games. So what does this enormous investment buy you then? First of all, it has a pretty decently impressive armoured profile, as you'd hope for such a mighty investment. It has a movement of 10, ballistic skill 3 plus, weapon skill of 5 plus, strength 9, toughness 9, 30 wounds, 8 attacks, leadership 9, and a 2 plus save. It's also further protected via its void shields, which give it a 5 plus inball save, which can also be taken against mortal wounds. But unfortunately, this does degrade once it takes damage, and once you're down to 15 wounds or less, it's only a 6 plus inball. In terms of war gear, it has two heavy flamers, two las cannons, one sky reaper battery, and a siege melter array. And in close combat, it fights with its crushing tracks. The siege melter array and the sky reaper battery are by far the most interesting weapons. That siege melter array is very short ranged, however. It only has a range of 12, but it is a heavy 43 weapon with strength 9, AP minus 4, and damage d6, and the usual melter rule that allows it to roll 2d6 and pick the highest if it's within 6 inches of its target. So it's pretty close to being the equivalent of 8 melter guns trapped together that are also strength 9. Not bad damage output, but honestly a little bit annoying that it's so short ranged. That Sky Reaper battery is somewhat more flexible, it's a heavy 8 weapon with strength 7, AP minus 1 and a flat damage of 5. It really is a bit of an unusual profile being so low in strength and AP, but so ridiculously high in terms of damage. As with many similar anti-air weapons, you add plus 1 to the hit roll if you're targeting a unit that can fly, and you suffer a minus 1 penalty to hit if it doesn't. When targeting a standard toughness 6 flyer, on average you'll typically get just under 2 successful wounds through, meaning you'll usually be getting 10 wounds through, which is pretty handy as that's often the amount of wounds that these toughness 6 flyers have to start with. So if you're facing some planes, this one might well just swap one out of the sky per turn. If you manage to get that siege melter array in range of a toughness 8 vehicle, you'll do on average 12 wounds to the thing, assuming it doesn't have an invo or anything. So if circumstances aligns, the Relic Mastodon might well be being able to kill two units per turn. Though of course both of them have their limitations, the Sky Reaper being massively better against planes, the Siege Melter Array being very short ranged. Even shorter ranged are the Relic Mastodon's crushing tracks. These strike at strength 9, AP minus 2 and damage D3 in close combat, and as it hits on 5s, you can typically be expecting about 3 of these whenever it fights in melee. It's not awful, but it's not really anything compared with an Imperial Knight's stomp attacks, for example. And Knights are far, far cheaper. The Mastodon has all the special rules that you'd expect. It has Angel of Death for the combat doctrines, giving it a bit of a boost turn 1, when Devastator Doctrine makes all of those guns just that little bit more dangerous, and Shock Assaults are giving it a mighty 9 attacks on the charge. It has a truly fearsome explosion, 
when if it dies and you roll a 6, then it will explode within 2d6 inches, and every unit within that range suffers a massive 2d6 mortal wounds. You really don't want this thing going up inside your own lines, and it might well be worth a command point reroll to try and make it explode if it's within the opponent's lines. It has power of the machine spirit, which means it doesn't suffer penalties for moving and firing heavy weapons. It has smoke launchers, if for some reason you want to forgo shooting your Sky Reaper battery. And those last cannons, then it can choose to be minus one to hit for the next shooting phase, but usually I don't think that's going to be worth it on such a massive tank. And finally, besides those void shields, it has the steel behemoth special rule, which means it can fall back and still shoot and charge, and it can still shoot while it's in close combat, though only the last cannons and heavy flamers can actually target the things that it's in close combat with, the rest of the guns have to shoot elsewhere. Of course, the primary purpose of the Mastodon is to transport a whole load of infantry, and potentially even dreadnoughts onto the table. It can transport 40 standard infantry models, though for unknown reasons it can't transport Primaris. It can however transport Terminator and Jump Pack models, who both take up the room of two models, and it can transport Centurions, which take up the place of three. Hilariously enough, it can also transport Dreadnoughts, Ironclad Dreadnoughts, Venerable Dreadnoughts, or Contempt Dreadnoughts, each of which take up the space of ten models. You could literally have four Contempt Dreadnoughts within the bowels of this thing, zoom it up the board, and have them jump out and start tearing the enemy to shreds when it gets in range. So quite a lot of options there, and we'll talk about them a little bit more in a bit. Overall though, the Mastodon is a very expensive tank, with a decent durability profile, but not quite as much damage output, bearing in mind the massive points cost that you're paying for it. Its primary function has to be as a transport, and it's going to be how well it can exploit that, to be whether or not it's actually any use on the table. So let's have a talk about some of the ways that we can get more out of the tank. First of all, it will always be stronger in some chapters than others. Iron hands are usually good for vehicles, and having a 6 plus feel no pain really helps out its durability, and boosted overwatch is great too, but probably their biggest advantage is being able to degrade slower, which on really massive vehicles like this makes a huge difference. It's also a great target for the iron stone, making it very very hard to kill indeed, with all the defensive layers, there's very little in your opponent's army that's going to be able to bring it down efficiently. All of their tricks for healing super heavies will certainly help as well. Raven Guard, or the stealthy chapter tactic, are also great for 2 plus save big tanks. Always being in cover outside of 12 inches is also another massive durability boost, and really will help it keep safe from things like AP3 last cannons and things, so it'll still get a 4 plus save against them. Salamanders can help out with the odd reroll, but getting plus 1 to wound in tactical doctrine from that siege melter array is very nice. You'll be wounding pretty much any vehicle in the game, barring super heavies like this on twos. It could also be a very nice target for the fire shield psychic power to make it minus 1 to hit, and the plus 1 toughness psychic power to make it toughness 10, meaning that even last cannons could be wounding it on fives. For armies like Black Templars, Blood Angels, and Space Wolves, its primary function is going to be a massive transport to deliver fragile but dangerous assault infantry, which all of these chapters have in abundance. And finally, Dark Angels could help in their unique Devastator Doctrine turn 1 to get that Siege Melter array in range right from the get-go. In terms of character support, obviously any Captain or Chapter Master or Lieutenant Auras will all be great for increased damage output, as will the Chaplain Litanies, such as the plus 1 to hit Litany, which can certainly help out with that Sky Reaper. Missile Array being able to hit more accurately against non-flyers. Any codex specific psychic powers could be handy, or Might of Heroes could again get it up to toughness 10, which could be a big deal if you're facing a lot of last cannons. Being a vehicle of course, Tech Marines or the Master of the Forge can also heal the thing. Stacking up to an extra 3 wounds on it per turn could be very good, particularly as the enemy has to work so hard to get them off it. In all honesty, it might be more use as a transport for other characters to hide in though, as it could get some very fighty characters considerably closer to enemy lines. In terms of stratagems, from the main codex it doesn't have tons of options, Armour of Contempt is one of the better ones to give it an extra save against mortal wounds, which could be quite an efficient way of getting through it, as they don't need to worry about its toughness 9 or 2 plus armour. As we already said, re-rolling the explodes result, either for a successful explosion when you're in your own lines, or if you fail to explode in the midst of the enemy army, could be absolutely game changing. I'd go as far as saying that it's worth keeping a command point spare so you can influence whether or not it detonates if you think it is likely to go down that turn. Other than that, basically any stratagem, relic, war or trait or anything else that improves its defence or offence capabilities is generally going to be worth taking on these enormous super heavies. For example, the Salamander Stratagem Crucible of War for plus one to wound rolls is going to be pretty good when you're firing with a number of very decent guns. 
So the main thing we'd really need to decide about the Mastodon is what we're going to put inside it in terms of transport capacity. It's incredibly flexible with that enormous 40 model hold, so you could have multiple squads of Terminators, Dreadnoughts, Centurions and all manner of fighty characters as well. But we'll talk about some potential options that really intrigue me. Firstly, I like the idea of either Ironclad Dreadnoughts or Contemptor Dreadnoughts being hidden within this thing using its enormous armoured bulk to get into the midfield, and then jumping out to put the smack down on some enemy heavies that are nearby. In particular, the ironclad isn't so very tough for its points cost, so being able to hide away until it gets into charge range is really quite powerful. Centurions are another solid option. It's a legitimate transport for assault centurions to get them into the centre of the board, then they can get out, hose everyone with flamers and hurricane bolter fire, and then charge to demolish some sort of enemy heavy armour. If you are thinking about taking some big scary units like this, it's probably worth taking along some buffing characters, setting up some captains and lieutenants next door to them as they get out could really give you a horrendously powerful beta strike. In terms of Terminators, I'm not quite as enamoured on transporting them in the Mastodon, just because they can deep strike and get where they need to go that way, so it sort of makes the tank just a little bit redundant. Though it could potentially allow some Assault Terminators to get a much shorter charge than they might have out of deep strike, to be fair. In terms of power armoured marines, things like Stern Guard or Vanguard veterans would certainly be solid. Perhaps even a clutch of Devastator squads jumping out with Grav Cannons next to some buffing characters would really give a very scary close range punch to blow away some enemy armour or infantry. One choice that I think would be really fun to play would be Blood Angel's Death Company, either with or without jump packs. Generally the enemy army is going to really struggle to chew through this thing over two turns, so you could have it as a massive bonker to jump out a couple of big squads of death company from, and hopefully go for a massive charge destroying a large part of the enemy army on turn two. And of course you could certainly include some buffing characters along with that big bomb of death. In an actual game I'd be wanting to load up the Mastodon with whatever scary goodies that are available, and deploy it somewhere fairly front and central, somewhere where the enemy isn't going to be able to outdistance it and run away from it while shooting it to bits. Ideally turn 1 would want to be trundling forward the full 10 inches and unload those heavy guns into whatever targets present themselves. If you can charge into something that isn't absolutely ludicrously scary in close combat then it's probably worth it just to gain that extra movement. And of course this thing doesn't really mind being in close combat as it'll be able to shoot out of combat while potentially not even being able to be shot itself if you manage to pin the unit in close combat with it. I'd aim for turn 2 being the turn when you get out most of your scary threats from inside the Mastodon and try and take the fight to the enemy, engaging whatever threats are within range. From there I'd just use the Mastodon to close with the enemy even further, maybe charging and tying up units if it can, and hopefully getting close enough to get that massive melter weapon to work. Overall it's not the most competitive unit in the world just because of how many points it costs. But the way the game is at the moment, most of these enormous Forge World models aren't the strongest thing in the world, but they're still really cool to put on the table. As always with these Forge World units, I'll certainly be interested to see how they choose to go about updating them when Games Workshop eventually gets round to updating the Forge World rulebooks. It'd be pretty nice to see things like this pointed a little bit more appropriately, and maybe being used a bit more in the competitive game as well. Having said that, having the vast majority of your army safe behind Toughness 9 2 plus armor saves for the first turn or two could really pose a challenge to some armies I know, and it could really give some armies problems if the remaining 1000 points get a massive jump on all of the units on their turn too. It'd certainly be an interesting sort of game. We'll most certainly be continuing with our Forge World unit reviews going into the future, starting with the ones that were voted the highest on the channel's Patreon page, and the Macedon was very much one of those, so feel free to check back to All Specs Tactics if you'd like to see more, or maybe subscribe to the channel if this video has been good. If you would like to support Horsepets Tactics, then the Patreon is the way to do it. As well as helping create new videos, you also get the benefit of voting on which ones come next, the occasional prize draw, and my own tournament lists and reports when I attend events. The link's in the description below if you're interested. In any case, thanks very much for listening. I'll hope to see you guys next time.